A recurring image in my video lectures is the light bulb. Light bulbs represent ideas, they also represent energy consumption, and they are one of the many modes of consumption that can have negative impacts on the environment. Certainly energy consumption depletes fossil fuels, fossil fuel consumption emits CO2, but there are other issues related to consumption like habitat destruction fishery depletion, those things can reduce the availability of food for people. There's also plastic pollution, water pollution, air pollution. Those have issues for and problems for the environment, but also for humans. Now, a lot of these issues are indeed related to consumption. Given that these problems have emerged through consumption, what happens in the future? Do these problems get worse? Can these levels of consumption be maintained? Perhaps there is a need, well I would say there is a need, for alternative modes of production and consumption to reduce these negative impacts. There's also a need to be able to track and monitor production and consumption and how changes going forward may have less of a negative impact. In this lecture I'll be talking about tracking production, and consumption. I'm going to go back to the example of energy use, and I'm going to talk about the context of Singapore. According to the National Environment Agency in 2014, 96% uh, of Singapore's greenhouse gas emissions were carbon dioxide. About one third of that carbon dioxide was emitted through electricity generation. And in Singapore, most, more than 95% of electricity comes from natural gas, that's a fossil fuel, which emits carbon dioxide. Where is this electricity used? Uh, well, according to the Energy Market Authority, uh, about 50,000 gigawatt hours of electricity was used in Singapore in 2018. What's a gigawatt hour? Most energy consumers are probably familiar with the kilowatt hour. That's the unit of billing. So energy consumers in Singapore generally pay about 20 cents per kilowatt hour. A kilowatt hour is a thousand watt hours. Uh, a gigawatt is a million kilowatts. And at 20 cents per kilowatt hour, 50,000 gigawatt hours costs about $10 billion. <clears throat> so at 20 cents per kilowatt, <clears throat> kilowatt hour, and based on this figure, Singapore consumed $10 billion worth of electricity in 2018. In what sectors was this energy consumed? Well, the most consumptive sector was industry, accounting for 43% followed by uh, commerce and retail at 37%, then transportation at 6%, and uh, finally uh, residential, the domestic sector at 14%. I'd like to uh, look at some of the uh, subcategories of consumption. So according to the Ministry of Trade and Industry, uh, they conducted a survey looking at the overall economy attributed to things like goods. 25% of Singapore's economy in 2019 was in the goods sector. 71% was in services, and then 4% was in dwellings. Dwellings refers to things like renting out properties. There's economic activity in renting out uh, dwellings and residences. So that's what that 4% represents. Now, uh, goods includes things like manufacturing, construction, and utilities. This is largely about production, the creation of stuff. Services is more about consumption, things like wholesale and retail, business services, transportation and storage, accommodation and food, etc. And so goods are largely about production, services are largely about consumption. And of course, if you look at the, uh, the numbers in brackets, yeah, from manufacturing down through other services, that adds up to 95%. You can add the 4% from dwellings, that adds up to 99%. Plus rounding error gets us to 100% of economic activity in 2019. Uh, but goods being productive and services being consumptive can be linked back to uh, Singapore's carbon emissions. According to Our World in Data, uh, consumption-based CO2 uh, emissions in Singapore were around 120 million tons, and that's about three times the level of production-based CO2 at around 40 million tons. If you look back at the previous slide, you'll see that the, uh, the services or those consumptive-based uh, aspects of the economy were almost triple that of the production-based goods economy. So there's a correspondence between the CO2 emissions and economic activity. 
Uh, so this idea represents uh, this notion of a materials economy. The materials economy is based on this Western-centric model of development uh, in which economic growth is the focus. Markets are driven by consumption. Most human activities focus on consumptive actions. Consumption is a lifelong activity. Before we are even born, our parents start making consumer decisions on our behalf and they continue making those decisions throughout our childhood. At some point, we become independent consumers, and we continue as consumers for the rest of our lives. And then finally, goods have both private and external costs. Private costs are the price of goods. So if I purchase a new phone, the purchase price is the private cost, but then there are also external costs. Manufacturing that phone may have been related to environmental degradation or some health issues in the place where it was manufactured. And those costs aren't built in to the price of the goods, but they are present. And it's kind of a problem with the materials economy that these aren't accounted for. Uh, I'm going to represent this notion of a materials economy using a, uh, an empty box. This box represents the Earth's or an ecosystem's capacity to support economic activity. And you can imagine within an ecosystem or within a, a portion of nature, humans extract resources. And so let's imagine this green volume represents the resources being extracted and those are used to support economic activity. Of course, in the process of producing and distributing goods, some pollution is generated by industries, and then also when consumers are done with their stuff, they dispose of it. That creates waste and pollution, which goes back into the environment and fills that box. Now, is this a bit of an exaggeration to say an economy completely fills what nature can provide? If you watched my lecture on carrying capacity, by some estimates, humans are occupying 1.6 Earth's worth of natural resources. We've actually overfilled that box. But the idea here is that we extract resources and we put crap back into the environment. And this is how we are using the environment. As long as we use the environment within its carrying capacity, then it is sustainable. So how do we get to within the bounds of that box? Uh, well, this is the materials economy, but there is an alternative, a more circular economy. You've probably heard that phrase before. The idea is instead of throwing waste back into the environment, there's still valuable resources in that waste which can be reintroduced to the economy and that reduces that waste and pollution going into the environment, reducing the pressures on the carrying capacity. But of course, if materials are being recycled, there's less of a need to extract materials to provide for goods and services. And so uh, this idea here is the circular economy. And that is, you can think of the city of tomorrow for which we should be, uh, we should be moving toward that, that ideal of a circular economy. And there are some characteristics of this. First, it is in contrast with that linear take, make, use, dispose model. It promotes uh, more innovative designs for products that are less wasteful in their use of resources. It promotes the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. That is an important way of reducing the materials needed and creating that economic circularization. And then finally, it emphasizes resource efficiency and effectiveness. Resource efficiency means the same products can be made with less resources, perhaps less materials, perhaps less air pollution, perhaps less uh, water and water pollution, that is more efficient use of resources. More effective use of resources has to do with things like product durability. If products are made to last longer, people replace them less often. They are less likely to create waste. People are more inclined to purchase these durable items in the secondhand market. And so that can help circularize the economy. Uh, I'm going to represent this idea of a circular economy by going back to this idea of extracting resources from the environment. So we extract resources and industries process those resources so they can be used by manufacturers to produce goods. Those goods go to uh, wholesalers and retailers who distribute them to consumers. This is the linear model. After consumers are done with products, they dispose of them and that creates waste in the environment. But there are many opportunities to circularize this process uh, that happen at each stage of this linear process. So for example, consumers can maintain the products they have. If products are more durable, they're easier to maintain. Um, if, if components can be replaced easily, then consumers are able to keep 
<clears throat> keep those products without having to go back to the store. They're cutting this entire linear process out. There's no more resource extraction, processing, production, distribution. They are keeping the products in their own hands. But if they can't maintain their products, or they choose not to keep their products, they can share them. This, this is another way of circularizing consumption. And so when consumers are done with their products, maybe somebody else would like that product and they can share the product. Now, sharing involves some sort of distribution, so the distribution is still there. And there are lots of distribution platforms that support this, websites like eBay and applications like Carousel. Uh, so many platforms for people to share, and that does involve distribution, but it cuts out resource extraction, processing, and production. Uh, the next step is things like, um, like refurbishing and reconditioning products. So products will go back to the manufacturer. Rather than discarding the whole product, the manufacturer, the manufacturer will either replace the older broken parts or extract the parts that still work and use those in new products. Now that still involves some production, which probably uses electricity. And then of course it involves distribution, but it cuts out a lot of the processing of raw resources because many of the resources can be taken out of existing products. And then finally, there's the idea of recycling. Now, recycling is a really good idea, but it, in many ways, it should be the last resort. If we can't maintain, if we can't share, if we can't refurbish, then we break down the products into their constituent materials and, um, and melt down the metals and, and shred the paper and shred the plastic and turn it into new materials. That does involve processing and then subsequently production and distribution, but it's cutting out that initial resource extraction. So it's still a huge benefit in that regard. Now this is the material side of a circular economy. There's also a biological side. You can think about this in terms of food consumption, for example. Um, so there are these cascading uh, cycles within consumers when it comes to things like food. Imagine you go out to dinner, you have a nice meal, uh, and then at the end there's a lot of leftovers. You take those leftovers home, hopefully in a reusable food container, uh, not a clamshell uh, polystyrene one. Um, and then you eat the food, the leftovers, perhaps the next day. And that's, that's recognizing the value in, in, those, uh, in, the, in the food. And I love uh, leftover pizza. So for me, actually, the value is just as good. But for a lot of leftovers, they aren't quite as good as the original, but there's still value in them as food. And that can be recognized through something as simple as taking leftovers home. Uh, and then there's a lot of food waste that doesn't get consumed. It shouldn't just be thrown away. It can be used as, as compost and it can be used to grow food at home. And so that's another one of those cascades. So a uh, meal at the restaurant, leftovers, compost. You can see how the resources related to food are kept within that cycle of consumers. It doesn't need, they don't need to go back to the restaurant, which is the distributor. They don't need to go back to the, the food manufacturers. It's, it's that smallest circle. But then there's a much broader circle, which has to do how humans practice food production in general. By being stewards of the environment, by using modern and, and efficient and sustainable agricultural practices, we can maintain the health of the biosphere. We can maintain soil quality, and that means less of a need to create new farmland. The same land can be used to produce more food. There are a lot of innovations for um, making better use of existing food production resources without having to draw down on more natural resources. That's more land, more water, um, and, and uh, not a, a lot of other environmental issues related to food production. And then there's also a kind of an intermediary cycle. I'm going to go off on a tangent for a moment. So in Singapore, the Public Utilities Board is responsible for dealing with toilet water, with sewage. And, and one of the things they do in that process is they separate the poop from the rest of the, the water. And they end up with this sludgy material. And they put it in uh, these machines called digesters. And what happens there is the bacteria in the poo digests the poo and emits methane. Methane is natural gas. That natural gas can be used to generate electricity. So resources from this waste product are being extracted and the result is electricity generation. Um, and so that's one biological circularization, but going back to this idea of food waste, something Singapore has been developing and implementing recently is co-digestion, where food waste is introduced to the digesters, and that provides another source of nutrients for the bacteria to generate methane. It's a great way of dealing with human waste and also 
food waste to create more natural gas, which can be used to generate electricity. Of course, that electricity generation emits carbon dioxide, but in many ways it is a nice uh, circularization of the biological side. Uh, by the way, I got the idea for this, for this diagram from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They have a very similar diagram on their website. They deal a lot with this idea of the circular economy. They're really pushing for that. So if you'd like to learn more about the circular economy, check out the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, there's a really great video on YouTube called The Story of Electronics. This is part of the Story of Stuff project where they're dealing with these issues related to the materials economy and promoting ideas of economic circularization. I'm not going to show that clip. It's about eight minutes long. But if you're one of my students who's been assigned to watch this video, then I'm also assigning that you watch this. I've included the link down in the description. If you're not one of my students and you're watching this lecture out of curiosity, I also encourage you to watch this, but I'm not requiring it. All right, so I'd like to get back to this idea of negative externalities. I talked about this on the slide on the materials economy, where there are uh, private and external costs of consumption. Uh, so externalities are uh, the attributes or the aspects of consumption that aren't built in to the price. And very often these attributes are negative. They incur some sort of cost. So some examples are the health effects of residents who live near a factory. The products and goods that are made in that factory will have a price. That price probably doesn't reflect the additional health care costs caused by the air and water pollution affecting people who live nearby. Another one is aquatic eutrophication from fertilizer. So um, uh, phosphorus and uh, nitrogen uh, runoff from fertilizer, enters aquatic ecosystems, creates algae blooms, the algae dies, bacteria consume the algae, reducing the oxygen content in the water, killing fish, right? And that negative externality, that loss of fish, isn't built into the price of the food that is grown from the fertilizer that ended up causing that eutrophication. Uh, healthcare costs from high calorie diets, so when consumers eat food, they pay for it. There's a price for the food that people consume. When they overconsume, it costs more, uh, more money out of the wallet, but also it can lead to problems like obesity, diabetes. Those incur healthcare costs for all of society, and those costs are not built into the price of food. Uh, farm animals and antibiotic resistance. A lot of farm animals are injected with antibiotics. That can lead to more antibiotic resistance, which also creates more healthcare costs, and that's not built into the price of meat. And then the last one I'll point out, there are so many of these, but ecosystem effects from deforestation. Ecosystems provide important services. Biodiversity helps maintain um, uh, food chains, for example. And so loss of biodiversity can be disruptive to other aspects of uh, food production. And so when there is deforestation, it can cause these types of ecosystem disruptions that create imbalances that actually negatively affect people. Those negative effects are not built in to the cost of the wood products or the paper products that come about from that deforestation. So how do we reduce these negative externalities? There are a number of ways. One focus is on consumers, promoting less, con less consumption or smarter consumption. This can be done through taxing more um, detrimental uh, consumer products or providing uh, rebates for the more uh, environmentally friendly ones. This can also be done through strategic communication, persuading consumers to pursue better alternatives. Uh, there are measures focused on production, so there can be incentives for producers to internalize those external costs, build those external costs into the retail price of the products they make. This can be done through regulations and subsidies, very much like taxes and subsidies for consumers. It can also be done through encouraging sustainability reporting. Companies can engage in more responsible behaviors things like um, better ecosystem management and, and uh, philanthropy, providing uh, or supporting social services. And those activities cost money, which end up getting built into the price of consumer products. It's overall part of the bottom line of the company. Uh, and then finally, uh, there's a need to estimate the in monetary terms, the cost of these externalities, the value of these externalities. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Thai mangroves have been estimated to provide more than $1,000 uh, benefit per hectare, and this has to do with coastline protection largely. Uh, and, so, and so production and consumption activities that damage those mangroves 
well, depending on how much mangroves they damage, a dollar amount can be assigned. A similar, uh, uh, in another context, a health context, uh, it's been estimated that U.S. childhood lead exposure costs the U.S. economy $43 billion per year. Lead exposure is largely from industrial processes. And, and so when those processes continue, a, a dollar value can be assigned in terms of the cost to society. And by understanding those costs of externalities in dollar terms, then there can be a better overall accounting. Uh, so one of the ways that producers are incentivized or encouraged to build, to work in the external costs is through the United Nations Global Compact. This is just one of many ways producers are incentivized, but according to this uh, compact, producers who agree and who are members of the compact uh, have some obligations, some broad obligations, for example, relating to human rights, uh, relating to labor practices, and then relating to environmental stewardship and eco-friendliness. Companies that are part of this, this global compact have a commitment uh, to pursue these ideals. This is a quick summary of, of what the UN Global Compact is all about, uh, but, but it's a model, it's a framework for businesses to engage in more sustainable behaviors that start to internalize some of those external costs. Uh, I'd like to also talk briefly about the Millennium Ecosystems Assessment. This is a project that attempts to assign monetary value to different aspects of ecosystem services. This is the value that humans get out of healthy ecosystems in terms of providing fresh air, uh, clean water, uh, rich fertile soil, uh, biodiversity. There's my fourth finger. Um, and. And they've done a pretty thorough job. This is all based on economic estimation, uh, but, but they're able to assign, at least a best guess, assign a value for these different external costs. And then that is another way of accounting for these costs in production and consumption. Now, there are some different ways of measuring these externalities. Yes, definitely there's the, the dollar cost of externalities. Um, but there's also a need to look at second and third order impacts and understand these external costs holistically. I'll give an example uh, in the context of food waste. Now, consumers have a tendency to prefer fruits and vegetables that are, uh, have a nice appearance. They're a good size, good shape, without blemishes, without deformities. And supermarkets know this. Supermarkets tend to reject ugly food from food wholesalers. And what does that result in? Well, the first order external cost is it results in food waste. Those are material resources or biological resources uh, that are created and then thrown away. It's just wasteful. A second order impact is water is wasted because producing food requires water. The water that goes into that food that is thrown away is also thrown away. Now, there's a third order impact. This has to do with the communities where that food is produced. In those communities, the water that's diverted to that food and then wasted is water that could have gone to the community, and this can create unnecessary water shortages. So there are all these impacts, and you can actually think of higher level impact. It's not, it's not just at the third order, or maybe there are multiple third order impacts, but it's important to recognize the external costs of production and consumption and wasteful production and consumption. Uh, it's important to recognize those external costs holistically. Now, measuring externalities uh, can be done with respect to sustainability indicators. For example, the three pillars of sustainable development. Uh, so external costs can be quantified in terms of, or external externalities, both positive and negative, can be understood in terms of economic impacts, in terms of overall gross national product, uh, things like employment. There are also uh, social indicators, so health, education, and transportation. Uh, external costs can negatively impact these. And then there are environmental sustainability indicators related to clean water and air, protected areas, etc. So externalities can be measured and quantified in terms of these three sustainability indicators. But there's a broader framework called the capital approach, which thinks about uh, different kinds of wealth. So certainly there's uh, financial capital. This is related to the economic pillar of sustainability. There's also produced capital, which is related, but this is more about the buildings and the infrastructure that we've created to support all other aspects of human development. There's natural capital. This is very much aligned with um, the environmental pillar of sustainable development. There's human capital. This has to do with uh, having healthy people and a healthy workforce. 
And then finally, there's social capital. This is more of the, the cultural aspect and things like education, um, some more of the intangible aspects of, of development and of wealth. And so there's value in each of these aspects of human activities. And there's an important idea in the capital approach. It's that using, using up one of these forms of wealth shouldn't just balance out uh, by creating more of another, but it should create more of that other form of wealth. Using financial capital, or sorry, I should say using, using natural capital, using natural resources, if it can be quantified in, in financial terms, should create a larger value in terms of financial gains, or should create more infrastructure as produced capital, or more jobs and more uh, trained workers as human capital. Um, now, of course, there's a, a stricter perspective on the use of natural capital. This is the strong argument for sustainable development, according to which natural capital has intrinsic value that can't be quantified, at least some aspects of natural capital do, and those shouldn't be used no matter what because there is no equivalent. It's not possible to create more value out of, out of uh, aspects of natural capital that have unquantifiable value. Uh, but that's a little bit beside this point. Um, I'd like to finish just by bringing this back to the context of Singapore. In Singapore, there's a project called Natural Capital Singapore. You can go to naturalcapital.sg to learn more about it. This project has researchers from uh, Singapore, from uh, Switzerland, and from other places focusing on quantifying the value of different aspects of Singapore's ecosystem so, so there can be a better understanding of how other aspects of human activities in, in Singapore, human development, is causing probably a lot of negative externalities, but overall understanding the externalities of human activities in Singapore uh, with respect to ecosystem services. So there's work being done in Singapore to really understand things like how our use of light bulbs is causing environmental problems in the, uh, in the natural areas of Singapore. So some work's being done in that regard. Anyway, I, I hope you uh, learned a few things in this video lecture about how production and consumption uh, have negative external costs and the traditional linear take, make, use, dispose model of economic activity and development is unsustainable in the future. We need to focus more on a circular economy, recognizing external costs, quantifying those costs, and using that knowledge to um, building that knowledge into the price of goods as a step toward economic circularization. Thanks for watching.